thank you for attending all of you and uh, I would want to sort of go through how this whole project of mine started because I used to work for Express Dairy for 17 years and when I left I had quite a lot of editions of the house magazine that I took away with me covering you know, a 30 odd year period and also had some photographs of my own press cuttings reports and things like this like many people I, i'm retired now i only retired a couple of years ago and uh, i thought okay well this is time to do something about this material maybe a few people would be interested in it so i started uh, scanning the material uh, purchased a domain chose a name for it started a new website and then i thought okay well no one's going to know about this unless i can promote it in some way so i started a facebook group as well. The pictures on the left of the screen, by the way, some of them are relevant to what I'm saying, some of them are not. This isn't an irrelevant one, but just an example of the sort of material that I either have or acquired. Quite interesting. A little, tiny little book meant for children. A little about me, though. I, I actually started work on a dairy farm in Crook and Somerset when I was 16. That's me here. Um, and then I moved to another dairy farm near Guildford. So I studied for a national certificate in agriculture. Um, I then went, got distinction, went on to university at, at Nottingham. And then I worked for the Milk Marketing Board at Thames Ditton for now long gone, but that was their headquarters. And then uh, got a degree in agriculture. And then I joined Express Dairy as a graduate trainee. And I worked for them for you know, 17 years in factory project manager positions and things like this. The factory actually in the picture on behind was the one I, I sort of managed a sort of million and a half pound project, re-equipping it and such like. After I got bored with that, I started my own software business and I ran that until a couple of years ago when I sold the business. But as it happened, maybe not surprisingly, we designed systems for food and dairy and brewing laboratories. So I visited many dairies including express dairies in that time uh, over over almost 30 years and made lots of friends and acquaintances in dairies and particularly in express and people that I'm still in contact with now and who've provided material for this project so what was express dairy well it has a long history it was founded in 1864 and it operated until 2003 when there were a series of buyouts and takeovers and other such things. But it was a big operation. I mean, by, even by their centenary, they employed 17,000 people. There were 250 plus shops and supermarkets. In fact, they were, one, they were the first company to introduce supermarkets into the UK. And they had a chain of hotels, restaurants, creameries and such like. So it was a big and complex operation. However, the company doesn't exist any, anymore. So I think probably I have a static audience, probably a diminishing number of people, in fact, who, who would be interested in the company. There are still a number of sites that were express sites still operating under different owners at different parts of the country. Um, there's a couple of creameries down in Devon, the one in Somerset at Froome, two, two in um, Shropshire and, and one in Scotland. So they're still operating, but under different companies. And some of the people that work for Express are in fact still working for the succeed, successor companies. What did I need to start this project? Well, this was one of the various items I needed to purchase. It's an A3 flatbed scanner of very high quality resolution. Um, I've got another document scanner, which is very, very fast and will scan photographs very, very quickly. Uh, I've got a film scanner for scanning films and transparencies and such like. And I've got a big monitor for editing and I need to keep calibrated as well to make sure that the images I'm editing are correctly colour rendered. And I've got several Windows PCs that I'm using, including the one I'm talking to you on now. So there was quite a bit involved. Some of this I had because I was in software, but some of it I had to purchase from scratch. So there was some reasonable expenditure getting set up for this. And in fact, just out of interest, when I go out, as I do quite often, to visit either museums or, or people who have material for me, I, I will can quite often take my scanner with me in the car and I've got my own internet connection which is mobile I connect the whole thing up with a laptop and I can actually sit there 
I remember I spent a morning at um, Honiton Museum earlier this year. Scan, they very kindly allowed me to scan maybe a hundred different documents and photos they had. So it's been it's been good and very very useful. So not and not just something I'm sitting here doing. Sometimes I'm out and about doing it as well. In terms of software, that was an important choice. Now, I use Adobe Lightroom for everything. And one of the things about using Lightroom as opposed to using, say, Photoshop or other image editors is that the original images that you capture or scan are never ever overwritten or changed. They're there permanently. The way the software works, and I, I hope I'm not going to too much detail here or telling, telling you all the things you already know. But the way the software works, as you edit an image, it only stores the changes you've made. You can reverse them at any time or indeed go back to the original. And I thought that was an important concept. So I'm going to go on in a minute to talk about editing and what to do and what not to do. But the thing is, I do have access to all the original documents. And I think probably from a museum aspect, maybe you you would see that as important as well and also everything is stored in the cloud so nothing can be lost i don't there's no local storage of any of the material that i have and it also means you can view and edit it from anywhere so i can edit and view images on my phone on a laptop if i'm out and about and such like you can put the material into albums which obviously i've done to sort things out and you can share those albums and allow other people to edit them as well so occasionally I've had contributors with more knowledge than me and they've gone through these and put ca additional captions and things like that on them. In terms of the website, I use Adobe Portfolio. Now this is linked to Lightroom. So what it in effect means is that when you create an album in Lightroom, so a set of photos, for example, about Credit and Creamery in, in Devon, all I need to do is link that album to the website and magically, all the images that are in the album magically appear on the website, complete with their captions and everything else. The only limitation is that each album can only contain up to 250 images, but that hasn't been a limitation because it's more, I try to keep them under that, in fact, to make it a bit easier to browse through and such like. I also use software to control the scanning, a product called Silverfast, which is very well known uh, that I use for scanning. Obviously, using a flatbed scanner, I can scan without the risk of damaging material that's loaned to me, which is clearly very important so, to make sure that everything is preserved in the way it was sent to me. And I've got other software I use for scanning a large number of photos. And believe it or not, you can put a, a stack of 50 photographs in the machine and it will scan, scan them in less than four minutes to a very high quality. So it's been very useful on occasions. I use some other software for colour replacement. And, and I also do a video editing, and there are quite a lot of videos I've created from video or other material that's been sent to me. And I use a product called TextMist Camtasia, which is very nice, easy to use. Um, and I, there's, sometimes I need to use OCR, optical character recognition, to scan text that's embedded in image. And I use a thing called Image Scan OCR, which is a free Microsoft Store app, and very good. And I for document publishing and this is something which is increasingly important because one of the things i've found is that the historical material is scattered in all sorts of different places small articles in different journals things from museums all sorts of different things all unrelated to each other and what I've been doing recently is try to create my own documents, bringing together all the information I've created from these diverse sources. And, and that's you know, quite a satisfying thing to do, quite tricky sometimes. And then I publish them as PDFs and people can download them or view them on the website as well. It is about the Facebook group. I started that just in March. And it grew amazingly quickly. I was talking earlier, I, I sort of felt that this was a very niche topic that, that, that wouldn't generate more than a handful of in, interest. But actually, we've got 950. I think we will get to 1,000 people in the group by the end of uh, this year in only six months. I do post in other Facebook groups too. Usually they're one of local history groups and things like that in areas where the company operated. I've got a rule that unless I occasionally post an unknown image where I don't know what it is and I'm asking people to, to, to tell me what it is, 
had a couple of replies this morning on an image of an old creamery that I posted. And usually, it, usually people are successful, but I always research and I post the topic, the source, and the year of the image. I won't put anything on the website, and I try not to put anything on Facebook where I don't know what it is and where it came from and roughly when it is, even if it's only the decade. Um, there are quite a few Facebook groups that, sorry, that will just post random images with no information at all about what it is, where it came from or anything. And that isn't my style at all. And I don't think it's appropriate. I haven't had any problems with spam or inappropriate comments. I, I have found it necessary to pre-approve new posts, except for some trusted members, which is a feature that Facebook allows. I've really only had to delete one or two posts in the time one pornographic post someone put on and someone else put something not very pleasant about somebody somebody and I removed that because it not the whole idea of the thing but I haven't had any problems like this at all and you know on a typical day on this group there are maybe 50 or 100 posts and probably a dozen actual comments about historical things so it's, it's been a successful group I think people have contributed new material but actually less than five percent than what I have has come from direct post on Facebook usually what happens is members contact me either through Facebook at messenger or an email and offer material to me um, sometimes they've already scanned it or photographed it um, they send it electronically and I've got a Dropbox folder people can put things in without a loss quality or people just use raw mail to, or post or courier material to me and, I, and I'll scan this here and then send it to them. Sometimes people don't want the material returned, but usually people want it back and I'm very careful in the way I handle everything. So here here on the left the picture here is a interesting little uh, booklet for children about where milk comes from. Somebody somebody sent me a copy of image quality. Now this this is a potential problem area. Facebook users tend to think that it's quite okay to send me some crazy picture with some backgrounds of <laughs> irrelevant material, things at funny angles or um, photograph like this one here. I, I know it's the wrong way around, but I can correct that. But photographed at a trapezoid angle, uh, things with an interesting um, silver dish given as a presentation, but photographed on a, on an old document box and things like this, or um, yeah, some, some interesting glasses that were given as a free diff that sat on an armchair with a, a cover over it, and someone with a, a hunting crop that was given as a, a, a gift to somebody who works at a Shrewsbury Creamery, but just randomly put on their table with all sorts of other miscellaneous things. I could go on, but you, I think you probably get the general idea. <laughs> so it is a problem area. Sometimes I, I suggest they, how they could improve a shot or I sort of send it by post or sometimes I'll visit and, and do the thing myself. So the various solutions to this. And uh, yeah, I can get a high quality image through Dropbox if I need it. And as, as I just mentioned, I do insist on knowing the topic, location and year before I put things on the website. And I need that because I decided at an early stage that within each section, I would order things chronologically. So if I don't know the year, that gives me a problem. So there are a couple of sections that are ordered in a different way by location, A to Z, order of location, but generally everything's in, in order chronologically. And these pictures here are the sort of thing that has that create quite a lot of interest, particularly group shots of people that used to work at somewhere. Um, the one the one down here that the, the the ladies were in the laboratory. Um, that was the Exeter, I think, and the group of uh, maintenance fitters. Um, and in fact, this guy here sitting down, I think this was a retirement due for him. He actually was an amateur photographer. And I, I mentioned in a minute, I got in touch with his daughter, who then gave me his complete collection of pictures. So it's very funny how one thing leads on to another. Another contentious area attribution and copyright. Every time I receive something, I record the source of it in the Lightroom database, which doesn't show on the website, but it's available to me. So I know where something has come from and who's given it to me um, and any other information. 
if I know that it's a copyrighted item, then I'll put the copyright on the image as well, the, orig the originator's copyright. If I don't know, it goes in as default as copyright to me. Yeah, I mean, the, I don't often know who has the copyright if anyone does in the images. I only know who gave it to me. And I always describe putting a caption on what the, the, what the item is. And here we are, this was this one here, was from 1950s from Minsterley, which is in Shropshire in Shrewsbury. And uh, this is the lady in the picture here. Someone who commented about the driver of the vehicle. Uh, it was actually her father. And I put that comment in as a, a, on a caption. And on the bottom, I put the name of the lady who gave me the picture in order to put it and where it came from as a Facebook group for a little village near to. So that's an example of the sort of commenting and captioning that I'm doing. And quite often people are putting quite detailed comments and memories in. And I'll, I'll put those in um, to the caption on the image as well but I, I must say I do correct grammatical and spelling errors which are numerous <laughs> so I don't put them on just as they're written I think it's nicer to people to correct their obvious grammar and spelling errors before putting them on the website so yes so what to do about images that have all sorts of weird things on them here this top left picture is the picture as I was given it, and the arrows are pointing to various splodges and spots and things on the image, and it's a weird sort of bluish colour as well. Below is how it looks after I've edited it. So I am removing spots and blemishes and things like that that's, that spoil the image, and generally with black and white images, I'm changing the colour to a standard black and white I'm not normally leaving them as sepia or faded or whatever weird colours they appear in. Often there are many, many blemishes on images. So this, this picture bottom right of the Marshall's Dairies truck, you can see the little circles here. Each of those represents a blob or a spot on the image that I've corrected and removed. So there's quite a lot of work involved in this. And I suppose there is a question, well, you know, is it appropriate to remove spots and images and, you know, whether it's right to correct the colours and things. I think the, the sort of view I've taken on this is I, I want the images to be interesting and useful. And after all, you know, to go back to the Marshall's Dairies truck, these spots were not part of the original scene. They, they were added as part of some subsequent editing or whatever. So I sort of feel reasonably happy about correcting them and improving them. But I'm sure you, you guys will have some opinion on this. And similar with colour cast correction, whoops, spot removal. Here again, the top picture here is an image as it was presented, the arrows to various artefacts on the photo. And it's a weird colour cast as well. And, I, and I, I've removed those blobs in the bottom of it and then uh, put it on the website, as you can see the bottom picture. Similar, another example. This is the orig original picture here, um, as presented. Uh, this is the removal of all the spots on it, which, as you can see, were very many. And on the right here is the final picture as it's presented. I don't know if I'm doing the right or the wrong thing, but that's what I've been doing. And it seems to add something to the collection anyway. Yeah, this harks back to something I mentioned earlier, that historical information is often very fragmented, and this is an example, or non-existent, really. So I, I've started little mini-research projects to bring together text and pictures about some niche or sub-topic from different sources. In some cases, I'm re-scanning or using OCR to retype the, the image, image in if I've got it. And um, on the left here is, is a little article I did about T.H. Lewis, who are a company that manufactured vehicles for Express Dairy. And I managed to cut together a whole sort of subset of some pictures and some text explaining about their operations. So, uh, and actually, I've been doing more and more of this and also generating videos and posting them on YouTube as well. I've got a YouTube channel for it. Express story tales as well. This involves sort of research and putting together information, which is which is interesting, I think. I've also made a number of visits to, to people that have interesting material. And I've been to Appleby and 
Cuddington and Cheshire, Exeter, Crediton, somewhere in Middlesex, Honiton, Shropshire, several visits to Shropshire, collecting the sort of images that are shown on the left here. So these are both actually at Minsterley and Shropshire. And one thing often triggers another. So I've met people on near the site who've introduced me to other people who in turn have then, um, and I mentioned earlier about the photographer that, that, that her his daughter contacted me and I and I managed to get in touch with her through Facebook and one thing leads on to another. So it's been very interesting. When people loan me material and I scan it, I always give them the full set of edited image back again for them to enjoy themselves or use them for their friends, relatives and children, things like that. So it seems to sort of work both ways in, in sort of a way. I've made a note of what costs have been involved in this because it's not minuscule. You know, I'm paying out subscriptions for various pieces of software, for the website and for things like that. So I, the summary table on the left is the sort of costs that, that I've incurred in the past six months on this project. doesn't incur, include any equipment costs. But yeah, it, it's not something that, and I probably would admit that this project has cost more in terms of money and definitely more in terms of time than I anticipated. I'm For the last few months, I've been spending three, four, five hours every day working on material that people have sent me, which is quite a commitment, really, uh, and much more than I expected. But, you know, if you could do a job, you may as well do it properly, I think. And lastly, you know, I do need to think about preserving this archive because what a shame it would be for all this work to be done and then eventually for it to be lost. And I, you know, there is some ongoing cost, even if the collection kept static as, as it is now. There is an ongoing cost involved in keeping the domain registered and the Adobe subscription for, for the website to be maintained and such like. And I have a, a a friend who may eventually agree to take on responsibility for this, but um, it's costing about £150 a year. And, and what I intend doing is make arrangements with my will. So when I go, someone can continue the collection. Or another alternative would be for, to, for some interested party, and don't ask me who that would be, because I've got no idea, who who could export all this data and information could be exported out and re-imported into another another method of making it available if that were possible. But I think probably the preservation of digital collections is something that affects all of us and all of you in the future. I think probably you have opinions on this, but I guess it's going to become something of increasing interest and possibly concern into the future. Well, thank you for attending, and I, I hope it was interesting. And uh, obviously, I'm very happy to take any questions you have or uh, or what have you but thank you that was fascinating thank you peter and i think you probably hit the nail on the head in that in that final slide when you sort of say it's it's something that i'm sure many museums are, are, are grappling with um in terms of digital um sustainability in terms of the the, the programs the formats the databases that we we utilize for our, our digital collections and probably the ones that aren't catalogued in any way as well of our, our own enterprises so our own you know records of events and activities and marketing images and things like that that maybe we we just sort of get so blasé about when the when thing but I mean it is just astounding what you've what you've achieved in the in the past six months or so if not if not a little bit longer now but just to to think about the the scale of what you've you've pulled together um Peter what do you do with the the items that uh, are kind of sent your way and, and not wish to be returned sort of thing so uh, when you do get those those donations where well I I've got some I keep well, I keep them obviously keep yeah. them safely um I have got a number of duplicates as well which, which I tend to give away duplicates to people who are interested and it seems as a bit of you know a bit of a generosity to do that um mm -hmm. But I I did actually attempt to give part of my collection some time ago to um, to Reading. Yes, yep. But um, if I'm honest, they didn't seem particularly interested in it <laughs> and put obstacles in my way to presenting it to them. So that didn't in fact happen. But I 
I'm, I'm more, I don't have any real need for the physical. I, I've probably got a, a pile of, um, you know, magazines and journals this, this thick. I'm more than happy to give it away because it doesn't, the physical side of it isn't of any interest to me. But, um, and in fact, another, another thing on this topic is that I've got a number of members of the group who themselves have substantial collections. And some of them, I mean, one, one one guy has got a collection of over 2,000 milk bottles and containers. I mean, the actual milk bottles and containers, not the pictures of them. And someone else has got milk float, which they have in their own collection. And people that probably, I should say, are at my stage of life, I'm in my 70s, thinking to themselves, well, do I really want this anymore? And what can I do with this? And I've had some, one of my reasons for joining the, the your network, in fact, was because one or two people asked me whether I could find a way that they could donate their material. And I, although I haven't, I've asked for some lists of uh, inventories of what people have, which I haven't actually received, but um, it's a, it's a sub, it's a subject of concern to quite a few people. Yeah. Well, when you put that, that time, energy and love into developing a collection, you sort of want to hope that there's a way that it will uh, continue in a, in a different format when you're when you're not there to to oversee it yourself and I think that's you know as true for the digital as as for the um as for the physical um but I guess that's that that slight worry is that you almost become the the sort of point at which point people think well maybe I can leave it to Peter <laughs> and I, I wondered whether you were inadvertently creating a, a physical archive as as well as the the digital archive just through through donations and and kind gifts sort of thing so yes but not of any great significance <laughs> trying yes. not to by the sounds of it trying <laughs> yes. to trying to focus in on the on the physical um yeah. and I found it also very fascinating your your sort of um uh the way that you approach preserving correcting uh altering the, the images but obviously with that that original scan still still retained mm. um but I think uh you sort of summed it up nicely in this sort of enjoyment factor of you know having an image that then vis uh your, your visitors to your website on Facebook can engage with can enjoy can interact with which then the flecks of dust on the original image that was then scanned or the scarring or the or the yeah the poor poor colour management yes. previously uh isn't detracting from from that so they can probably have a a far better engagement with it on the understanding that if a particular image was something they wanted to explore further I'm sure then then you could be able to extract the the original artifact uh, I, I see there being a as a, there's a we're talking about images here but mm. there's a, um the same issue surely must apply to rural museums collections of physical objects like a, an old rusty old plow or something like this you know actually when farmers had machinery on their farms, they generally looked after them and maintained them and stopped them going rusty. They're often quite shiny, in fact, and were painted regularly because they were something that was important to do the job. But of course, when you see them in museums, it's usually because they've been abandoned somewhere in a field somewhere and someone's thought, OK, that would be an interesting thing for people to have. In a way, you have the same dilemma. Do you bring the item back to the condition in which it was when it was in use or do you leave it as a rusty relic? for people to admire I, I don't know what the answer is to that but maybe you you do <laughs> I think it's it's it is that dilemma isn't it and you know I know George Munger couldn't be here today but uh, as a as a conservator the level of intervention that you 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 ever have with any of your objects it's so important because you don't want to detract from from the age and the experience uh, you know the the life history of that the, that object and, and enabling that to uh, to be demonstrated you don't make it look shiny new um untouched but equally you want to make sure it's preserved so that future generations will understand how it operated and, and the format in which it did um so yeah i think it's it's like anything you kind of there is always that balance and that compromise and that ident you know working out the the right solution for for each individual object but um, May I ask then, from a museum perspective, mm. do, do do you disapprove of me uh, altering these images and improving them? Is it something that you wouldn't want to do if it was part of your collection? I don't know if any of my, my museum colleagues have a have a thought on that one. You would still have the original, presumably. So, you know, you've got the two. 
yeah. you've got the better better one and the original one so i think you'd be you'd be fine with that yeah i mean that was interesting to hear that the program that you use and i've now forgotten the completely <laughs> forgotten the name was it light well, lightroom 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 yeah uh gives you that option of you know not overwriting that original scan so um, it's actually not even an option it's the way it works it's, it's it the is, default uh, setting yeah 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 well it's the way it works it only stores the editing changes and, and obviously you can't see well you can actually go back through them all un, undoing things that you've done one one by one which is quite useful <laughs> does it generate those images with all the little white circles on it in the sense of will it show you where you have edited um, yes. at a glance or yeah absolutely yes yes yeah. I, I, if you're interested i show you that now stop sharing and then if i share screen share different window because that's almost uh just as important sort of seeing where you've where you've gone sort of thing yes. okay Let me just find an image uh, that, that this applies to i wouldn't have to look too hard but uh, While you're looking, Peter, have you ever had to turn things down, sort of collecting policy sort of style, where people have gone off on too many tangents, and you think actually this is this isn't yes, amazing? Yes, I've got um, I've got currently 465 <laughs> images not used, not used, <laughs> where I've rejected for various reasons. In yeah. some cases, it may be because I just don't know who they are, where they were, and or when they and were, and you I can't connect it back necessarily to express. Yeah. Yes, Actually, or yeah. it may be that the image quality is so poor, or mm -hmm. maybe they're too repetitive. You know, there's an image here of a milk float, but I didn't consider it interestingly enough, interesting enough to yeah. warrant things like that. Leading. So yes, there are quite a lot. So a... But yes, going back to oh, yeah, sorry, back. I distracted no, no, no. you. So no, that's okay. I'll find one here. Okay. Oh, there we go. Right. So yeah, I, I you every one of these little spots here reveal some blemish or something that you yeah and uh, i can go back in history mm -hmm. and i can um go back to the original you can see it's popped yeah. up now there we and go. now i click on this and here's the original one and here you know there's one of the ones i hid a little blob on this thing and one yes. there and they're not this particular one there and they're not uh, this goes back to what i was saying when is an artifact not an artifact so mm -hmm. looking at this here Possibly there was a white blob on the platform, mm -hmm. <laughs> or possibly it's just an artifact on the image. Or it may have been a, a piece of dust on the scanner when, not when you did it, but when a previous copy yeah, was yes. made or something like that. Yes. Um, so I don't always know. So I tend to, um, yeah, I mean, here, here's another one. There's quite a few blemishes on this mm -hmm. that, that I've hidden. Um, yes. And and uh, and as I say, you can revert back any time. Yeah. Just go back to what it, how it was originally. So yeah, it's 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 good. So. I was impressed at the the kind of the quality of the image as well in terms of the scan and the and thing. So does this does your system automatically then downscale those to appear on the website or because I'm Are assuming you... you're retaining those sort of higher higher resolution yes. images in your in your files, but probably don't want those on the website or are they i'm re usually reducing them to 80 percent to put them on the right. website just oh, so to still make them quite... load so they're quite good quite large still um, yeah yes. on there. but actually when you download an image from facebook by right clicking on it and save as there's actually a further reduction in the image yes. quality so it's not so when people ask me for uh, or i feel it's appropriate to give someone a high resolution image then i just do that in the software i go just back to the I, original. I just yeah. go to um uh ex export when you export you can choose what quality to export as so i'll export okay. as 100 percent yeah, uh, and then send it send it in that form to people. I mean, I've got in this in total. Mm. I'm actually using this software. Some other images, not Express Stereo related as well. But I mean, I've got thirty two thousand two three hundred and fourteen images. So there's no real limit, and the, all of that is scored in the cloud. I don't need any storage to do to of my own to achieve that so you know I'd, I'd recommend this software i mean obviously adobe is a very well-known company with a very good reputation used by professionals so mm. yeah it's worked out well yes that's it it's the sustainability of any any software you use or the company you use it you want it to be able to update sort of five ten 
15 years down the line and yes. it'll still be accessible, don't you? So, again, picking yes. a, a well-known right. brand, it yes. probably reduces the risk of uh, of things becoming obsolete. But thank you again, Peter, anyway, so well, much for your time today. That's been, uh, I mean... Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. Cheers. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.